of Allah. Bismillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. To, today we are going to have a session. Um, Fatma Jana Medical Alumni Association in collaboration with MD International are going to talk about pathways to medicine in Canada. So I'm going to be your host. My name is Dr. Fiza Rafiq. I am a family physician here in Calgary, Canada uh, since 2005. And um, I am assistant professor with the uh, University of uh, Calgary, uh, Cummings School of Medicine. I'm also president of Fatma Jana Medical Alumni Association in North America and I am a member of Board of Trustees of MD International. So on behalf of MD International and Fatma Jana Medical Alumni Association, I welcome all of you to, uh, in today's session. And I, I have great speakers with me. Uh, they're joining me and they're going to um, tell us what are the pathways to Canada. I know many people, uh, they know about pathways to USA, pathways to England, uh, but not many people know about pathways to Canada. And it is very important to learn uh, because these are very different than USA and, and England. Uh, and we need to learn more about these before coming to Canada so that we don't face many difficulties. So first of all, I will invite uh, Dr. Ome Eman Adnan. Uh, she is also from Calgary and uh, she is the chair of M IMG Committee of MD International. Uh, Ome Eman Adnan is working with us uh, in Calgary for past many years. And I will ask uh, Eman to introduce herself and then she is going to talk about the pathways to medicine in Canada. So over to you, Eman. Thank you very much, Dr. Fiza. Indeed, it's an honor to be um, a part of this program today, tonight. Um, everyone, uh, there is a little bit of a uh, difference in time zone. So hence we use tonight while it would be morning right there in Pakistan. I'm Dr. Umay Adnan, and I'm an, in, I'm an international medical graduate from Madaw Medical College, Karachi. And um, I'm currently, I'm working as a clinical assistant in general interim medicine uh, with Alberta Health Services in two different Calgary hospitals. I welcome you all uh, today and thank you so much, Fiza, uh, Dr. Fiza, and all the rest of the speakers to join us tonight for this session. Um, today, um, we're gonna talk about few pathways here and I'm gonna take the lead by talking about the pathway for CARMS. It is the pathway that is usually taken for people like me who have not completed a formal residency training back in Pakistan. And we hope to do a formal residency training here in Canada. It may be one of the pathways that you would want to explore. At this point in time, we're just gonna talk about the different routes and um, you can certainly decide which suits your needs the best and which is the best fit for you uh, that you would want to go ahead with. Um, so here, I'm gonna talk about um, this information session here. Um, and today our agenda would be our steps to licensure. So the first and the foremost, when you complete your, um, your medical schooling, a lot of times you might have seen that a lot of your colleagues or peers around um, there in the med school would be preparing for different exams or at least by third or fourth year, they have their minds set on what would they be pursuing in the, in the ne next couple of years if they would be wanting to pursue a medical residency there in Pakistan or they would want to go ahead and uh, explore different routes. We are specifically talking about Canada here and what would be the best um, thing would be to know what are the different steps that, would, that you would have to take in order to pursue residency here in Canada. So that by the time you apply for the residency, you're well aware of what is expected, what are the exams that you have to take. And there's a sequence of things that you have to follow in order to uh, be eligible for application for CARMS. So um, next slide, please. So um, just a very warm welcome for all of you in this session tonight. And, I, and we really hope that it's fruitful for you. It's beneficial for you in terms of deciding what your next goals would be, having the information so that you can make better and informed decision, in especially about uh, the next steps. 
So the first and the foremost, um, while there is a lot of information out there in terms of the routes to licensure in different countries, um, please bear in mind that in Canada, it's the routes are there. It's just that the struggle um, may be a little bit more just because there, there are not as many institutions that are preparing you for, for example, PLAB or NLEs. They've been there for quite some time. The other thing here that happens is there are very limited um, spots for residency. Hence, it's highly competitive, but that does not mean that you can't get in. So bear in mind that perseverance is the key to get your things here in, um, in Canada if you're wanting to pursue uh, clinical practice. But for that matter, at any point in time, if you're, if you're hoping to move to Canada and even wanting to pursue another uh, maybe um, profession in terms of maybe a slight uh, alter alternative pathway or something else, but just perseverance would be something that you'd have to bear in mind for, for the longest time that you can imagine. Um, the first thing here would be you read through the Medical Council of Canada website. This is a website that has every possible information that you need to have in order to take any of the examinations. And um, while going through that website, I personally, what I would share my experience here is that when you go through the website once, you do get that information that, okay, these are the things, but sometimes you get you, you gotta go through it again and again in order to just absorb all that is in there because it is the main thing that is gonna give you all the routes that are available out here in Canada. The next thing here, point number two that I'm talking, that I'm gonna talk about is the physician supply account. What is physician supply? So it's basically, um, it's, it's, it's a medical repository where all of your um, documents are saved and that is for life. So for that matter, they have to run it through source verifications. And what happens is that it's, it's a process of about a couple of weeks and you will get um, the approximate information on the Medical Council of Canada website as well as that for the physician supply as well. Um, it takes about a couple of weeks. You have to submit your documents. They send it um, for the source verification. And once the source verification is done, you rec uh, your, your documents are then marked in green and they're ready to be used for your examinations and for, the, for any licensing bodies that you need to share it with. Um, please recognize that um, for all these, for while mcc.ca does have all the information, all exams um, are usually uh, mentioned here in Canadian dollars, given the fact that it's, it's a Canadian thing, uh, it's a Canadian exam and Canadian um, processes. Similar happens um, there in the physiciansapply.ca as well. Um, I'm not exactly remembering how much, but I do remember it was something around $300 or something to um, enroll yourself for the first time. And then it is um, it is a hundred and something dollars for every document that needs to be source verified. So um, the next thing that I'm gonna talk about here is you pick up the steps to licensure. So once you go through, you skim through it and you absorb every information that's there on the mcc.ca website and see what is the best route, best suited route for you. A lot of times people who have completed uh, the formal residency training would prefer not to go through the entire process all over again. So there, there is another pathway that is available out there and that other uh, my uh, other speakers here tonight would be uh, talking about. Um, the steps to licensure um, that I'm gonna talk about today is specific to Alberta. Given the fact that we're all Calgary-based, all the speakers um, um, here, including Dr. Fizza and myself and other two speakers here, we're all based in Alberta. 
However, the information about different provinces and their licensures can be slightly different. However, what is important here is that Medical Council of Canada exams remain same all throughout, regardless of whichever province you take them in. When it comes to uh, applying to different, pros, uh, different provinces, that's when each of the um, programs have their own prerequisites, which would we will talk about later because CARMS, again, is a process. Like uh, if, if you're aware of US assemblies, that there's a process with ECFMG that goes through. And then also um, for PLABS, uh, there is a GMC process that has to go through. So similarly, here in Canada, it's mcc.ca and the physicians apply kind of thing. And then for residency, it's the CARMS that you'll have to go through. It's a whole process. Um, next slide, please. So the first thing first, when you, when you think about um, pursuing a residency here in Alberta or Canada for that matter, um, well, most of the times, what is the first prerequisite is that you have to be either a Canadian citizen or a PR uh, or a permanent residence uh, card holder here. So for people who, um, who have that, because a lot of times we immigrate, like I, like for example, I immigrated. So at that point in time, when, when I started to take my examinations, I wasn't a citizen, I was a permanent resident. So this is important. This is extremely important because this is going to be um, something that will stick with you for the entire process, um, be it in any of the routes of licensure. It doesn't have to be that you have to be a citizen, but at least you have to have that permanent residence here. Uh, things may have, and things change a lot of times. They may allow people with uh, work permits, but I'm not really sure. So please don't quote me on that. Um, what I would uh, highly recommend is go through the websites and they get updated very often. So keep yourself up with that. The next thing here is the medical degree from an institution that is recognized by FAMER. So they have an organization that recognizes all the medical institutes. And what is imperative is that your medical institution should be listed in that particular um, list that is uh, endorsed by the, that is uh, you know, available at the, at the FAMER um, website. So if you if you go through if you go through that you will know that there's a repository of those medical schools that are that are considered and they are recognized um, because a lot of times the, there may be incidences where um, lesser known schools or um, schools with they may have uh, some issues you know back at some point in time may be may not be listed there. And in, in situation where you find yourself, um, you know, in a situation where you're not sure if it's listed, um, try with the with with slight differences or maybe write to them so that um, you get the direct information. Um, what I'm going to emphasize here is also that um, while it may be the easiest way to ask somebody like myself or Dr. Fiza or somebody else here. What is very encouraged here in, in, in Canadian work ethics is that you write to the person who, um, who is responsible for that. So for smaller things, for um, you we will be able to navigate everything that's available on the website. However, if you have questions, maybe ask us or write to the mcc.ca if you have any ambiguities. The next point here is that, um, residency training of 24 months and above with entering and exiting exams. So that is very much so for another route that's called a PRA. However, what is extremely, extremely, extremely important, so I'm, I'm quoting here, emphasizing here on extremely, is the one year or more uh, clinical rotational, broad-based clinical rotational experience you have to have that house job in hand. Um, 
it's not that you will not get through because it's very different when it comes to uh, U.S. assemblies. You don't have to wait for your house jobs to be completed um, or for that matter, do the house jobs prior to starting the residency. But in Canada, please bear in mind that it is quite a journey and you may have to um, have at least hands-on experience if you are to apply for any other jobs that are um, you know, especially meant to um, get you some financial freedom. Because practically speaking, there, there are a lot of facets of life that we have to um, bear in mind uh, while applying for exams and pursuing um, residency or um, studies in, 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 in maybe uh, within the country or outside of the country. So finances certainly have to be um, a huge a huge thing that sort of come into play, but your house job will be something that will be required by the physician's apply for, um, for a licensure. And you wouldn't be able to uh, produce your PMDC licensure if you don't have the house job. So you know what I mean? It's, it's the two things that are very interrelated. You have to have the house job in order to have a valid PMDC license. And if you don't have a PMDC license, you're a medical grad, but then you don't have the license even in Pakistan. So that can be very tricky when you are entering into a system um, that um, certainly is, um, is not as easy to get in. So having those bits and pieces uh, you know, taken care of already really saves you a huge uh, lot of, I would say, not great parts of the journey. Um, however, every journey is different and we truly respect uh, whatever you know, comes our way and we learn through it. The next thing here is experience of working independently. So if you have that, you, you can only do that if you have um, a practice, a license to practice or a PMDC or PMC registration for that matter. It's, it's changed to PMC, Pakistan Medical Council at the time when I graduated or a lot of us here. Um, it was called Pakistan Medical and Dental Council. And we had our licenses from them. But now if you know you need them renewed or whatever, it is through the, the PMC. When you're working independently, the amount of time that you have worked may or may not be taken too much into account. But um, for uh, for for my uh, time, like I can I can I can let you know that when I came in here, I had just about six, almost six months of working as an MO, like a medical officer. So um, it's been quite a journey. I'm not into the residency yet, but I am in in a situation where I work with the Alberta Health Services in in the in a program that is designed only for international medical graduates. Who, um, who have completed the, you know, the, the house job training, the broad-based rotational training. And uh, we work with the license of uh, CPSA, which is a limited practice license and it's under supervision. So that, that's actually a lot of, that's a lot of information to absorb. I do understand that, but it's important to mention those things because um, when you would go through different um, different websites and when you will go through different routes of licensure and then when you will go through different options that you can possibly use here when you're when you're not yet into the residence you're when you're not read, uh, yet into the uh, practice readiness assessment um, route what are the other things that you can possibly do so explore all those options the next slide please so again, this is just a reiteration of all the things that I've just mentioned. So I'm just quickly gonna go uh, skim through them. So you read carefully through mcc.ca, that's the Medical Council of Canada website. It has all the information you need and I mean it. So you, you will have all the information regarding the steps that you have to take regarding the exam preparation, the examination centers, the examination fee, the examination resources, the places that hold um, 
the examinations, the time frame that is required uh, for you to, you know, enroll for an exam for the next cycle. So all of that information is very much available there at the mcc.ca. And it also has um, other resources that you can possibly utilize. So make sure that you go through it. Then your registration to the physician's apply. This is something that's first and the foremost. So if you decide uh, that you are hoping to move to Canada at some point in time, physiciansapply.ca is something to get you started. You, you submit your documentations and you apply for examinations through Physicians Apply. So this is extremely important step to have your documents um, uh, verified. Uh, when I was, uh, just a quick thing here, uh, just a recollection of mine, um, evaluation exam, the Medical Council of Canada evaluation exam has um, actually um, really been waived around the time when I started my journey, it was the first exam that we had to take. And only for that examination, they had that little bit of leverage where you could still go ahead and um, apply for the exam, but you had to wait uh, for the source verifications to be back by your university to be able to sit for that exam. So you could book in advance or like earlier, but before, like when you were sitting for the exam, you were supposed to have your uh, documents verified. I'm not sure if this is the same thing that's happening with QE1 because that happens to be the first exam now that EE is no more there. Um, so please make sure that you go through it um, really, uh, really carefully. And then the next thing here is familiar, familiarize yourself with the routes. Um, explore with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta and even the the societies that are taking, um, you know, the, the licensing bodies um, of Canada for that matter. So you can look into, there are different licensing bodies, like uh, you're talking about the CPSA, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta. There are, um, there are similar uh, licensing bodies um, and the gov governing bodies, which are um, for each and every province. So the province that you intend to move to that's the information that you would have to uh, gather if there are further practice readiness routes. And my other colleagues will talk more about it. And, uh, and then by a CARMS pathway. Uh, so CARMS pathway, um, I'm gonna reiterate again, is, is for the residency. It's for a formal residency training. So if you're looking at formal residency training, and you may choose between the two, whether you take a residency training or you enter through um, a practice readiness route or another route that you feel comfortable. However, if you have completed a residency, you can still pursue a residency here in Canada. So there is no restriction that if you have completed a residency, you will not be allowed to participate in CONS. That's not really true. So you can still do that. Um, the next step here is, um, sorry for the wrong numbering there, and I'm just spotting that out. Um, gather the resources to prepare for exams and reach out to preparatory classes and peers. Um, now, this is the kind of information where, which, which would uh, be extremely beneficial if you decide to take on the licensing, licensing exams in Canada. So the ones that we are talking about here in the directions for immigrants, these are based here in Calgary. Um, there, I'm not aware of any of the um, institutions or any prep um, resources that are happening there in Pakistan um, that I can endorse. But from my experience, I can tell that um, it's a lot of it, it's a lot of um, your own effort when you when you're when you're wanting to take those exams, but having a peer or you know a student a study partner certainly goes a long way because um, the, preparing for these exams with with huge course that you got to cover is certainly very uh, demanding as well as it maybe it it can get you flustered. So it's always nice to have somebody in who is preparing with you, and that sort of helps. And that's pretty much with um, SMEs as well, if you're looking in those uh, lines. 
Um, the next thing here is for comms pathway aim for higher scores in um, QE1, NAC, IELTS, um, seven and above that deems you eligible. So just a little clarification here. CARMS is the, the resident matching system for Canada. MCCQE1 is an exam that you have to take, which is based, uh, we'll I'll talk about it later in a little bit at length, but this stands for the Medical Council of Canada Qualifying Exam Part 1. And that is, that is a theory-based exam, which um, is basically best choice questions, like it's an MCQ, uh, MCQ type. Um, and then it has a component which has a clinical decision-making that's called CDM. So both of them comprise, um, a, they sort of, you know, constitute the qualifying exam part one. And for those of you, because MCC allows you to take one exam before the other, the NAC is a national um, something collaboration and it's basically ASCII. So, you know, ASCII is if you're going through your med school, you would know they are, they are the objective structural clinical examination. Um, uh, Ex, uh, exams. And those exams are purely based on your clinical skills. But that does not mean that just by having the clinical skills, you would be able to ace them. You have to have solid foundation uh, with theoretical knowledge in order to ace. And for that matter, I would, even if you're trying to, uh, you know, wanting to take NAC before QE1, um, I would highly encourage you to reconsider that and take QE1 first and then go ahead with NAC because things get very easier when you've been through the, the theory part. And then when clinical part is there, it's a lot of hands-on, um, clinical associated, very um, exam that, uh, that tests a lot of your soft skills, including your communication, your ability to empathize, and a lot of different aspects that we're gonna talk about later. IELTS here is um, the English language exam. So you have to have a benchmark in order to be eligible for CARMS. And that benchmark is you have to have seven and above in uh, the different components of IELTS, which are speaking, writing, listening, and one more. Can somebody remind me of that? Speaking. Thank you, speaking. So um, that is um, the four different components files that they're gonna test you over. And if by any chance you are not able to um, uh, Laila Khadim, I'm seeing your question here. I'm just going to answer it right after. Um, uh, and for if, if for, for example, a lot of people, a lot of us um, who have English as our second language do struggle to get um, that high score in all of the components. Um, sometimes you can certainly retake that. But then again, bear in mind that like any other examination, this needs a little bit of preparation as well and um, be able to recognize what is being tested and how you need to prepare for that. So I wouldn't say taking any courses is something that's going to be helpful, but IELTS book is available there in Urdu Bazaar. And I'm sure there are a lot of resources out there um, online as well. Uh, so please make use of that. and. Um, before uh, before IELTS, it was TOEFL, but things are changing. So IELTS has been consistently there for about past two to three years. Um, and now OET is the next exam that is being you know, recognized as well. However, I am not sure how things would be uh, going forward because every province in, in Canada has their own prerequisites. Some people, um, do require IELTS, but they also require um, a computer multi, multiple mini interview. Um, some may not require that. So, so it things keep changing. So what's important here is that you keep yourself up to date with what is out there and what is, what is expected of you. 
So when you go through the mcc.ca website and you go through the Physicians Apply and you're thinking about CARMS route, go to the CARMS website as well and read through what might be, um, what are the things and how the process works. So that just gives you a fair idea of what to and how to pursue. The next thing here is then again, uh, learn about resources and explore further to help you through the process. So this is extremely important. It's, it's very overwhelming to have all of that information. And even though I'm trying to um, give this information in a very, um, because we're, again, it's, 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 it's a long process, but we're just trying to condense all that information so that the, to give you the highlights of what you got to do. So what's important here is that if you decide to um, go for the Canadian route, you learn about all the resources that are out there. And um, it's, 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 it, there's a lot of information in terms of what we can do. Um, my colleagues would agree that when we Google that, how easy it is to get residency in, in Canada, uh, there is one thing that just shows up all the time, if not every time, but most of the time, is that Canada is a closed door for international medical graduates. And um, it may be true to a certain extent, but a lot of people who have matched into the residencies are living proof that it's not completely true. And those who have entered into the clinical practice via other routes are a living proof as well that this is, I mean, it is very frustrating. It is very, very flustering. It is very discouraging more times than not, but um, it's important that, you know, the truth is out there that it is difficult, but it is doable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a brief overview of different exams here. Um, the exam one that, again, I'm gonna talk about QE1 first, because in my experience, this exam would get you started. Uh, just like if you were to take step one or step two, you know that a lot of information that would be step two, um, Emily would be based on step one. So it's pretty much the same. Uh, so QE1, again, uh, like I mentioned, it would be comprising of um, MCQs plus the clinical decision-making part. And this remains valid once it is taken. What you have to do in here is aim for higher scores. The scores are extremely important in, um, in Canadian um, resident matching system. However, they're not the only thing that you will be assessed on. So that is that. And then uh, please bear in mind as well that it takes a couple of months. It really depends upon your current knowledge, but there is always a way to take that examination. When we took QE1, uh, like myself or my colleagues, things weren't out there for a lot of, um, from the MCC uh, website, where we could potentially um, have the resources uh, in terms of practice questions. But now they're available. You just have to go buy them. And uh, there are a couple of hundred dollars, but I'm not exactly sure. So don't quote me on that. But I would encourage you to go through them. The information is out there. The next exam here that we're gonna talk about is NAC OSCE. So as, as we talk about this National Association Collaboration, uh, Objective Structure of Clinical Examination. And this is based on your clinical skills. However, the clinical skills is a, is um, comprises of a lot of skills that um, that that are included in your um, in in how you're 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 doing the clinical examination. It in, it does involve um, your clinical your communication skills. It does involve how your body language is. It does um, involve how. Um, your stance is, um, how least judgmental you are with the patient or your judgmental. So there are a lot of things. And then when you talk to the, to the um, sorry about that. So when you talk to the patients, is it, sure, Dr. Pizza, thank you so much. So, um, so the next, um, so yeah, for, for this 
there, there are a lot of different things that need uh, to be taken care of, and they're usually recognized as CAN med roles. And um, you, will, you will have that information once you go through the mcc.ca website. Uh, this is the exam that you can possibly retake. However, it remains valid once you've taken it, but you can still certainly improvise on your scores if you want to. And uh, this is the scoring of Nakoski keeps changing and currently it's out of 1500, but if it changes in the coming years, you'll just have to keep an eye on how things are. Um, the next exam here is the English language exam. I would say um, MCQE one, no, you cannot. It, it's, it's just taken once. So hence the emphasis of securing really high mark on there. Um, the IELTS exam, I, I'm not sure how things would be, but again, if it's if OET is coming in, that's where the two of the language uh, exams would be uh, would be out there. However, there is an expiry. I don't know about OET as I have no um, exposure to that, but for IELTS, there is a two year uh, valid, validation time. It gets expires, it expired every two years. And please bear in mind, every time you take it after two years, you have to have uh, seven and, and above in each component in order to be eligible for CARMS. Um, the fourth exam here is, um, well, it's it's more so province-based, but when, when we talk about Alberta, there are two exams that we have to take um, for a particular CARMS cycle. That is called CASPER, um, which is an online multiple mini interview kind of exam, and then uh, multiple mini interviews. Uh, they are, again, they're scenario-based um, and, and heavily uh, epic-based questions that you have to navigate through different situations. And they, uh, they assess your aptitude and your ability to know the CANMED roles. And um, you have to take uh, these exams every year until you match into the residency. Next slide, please. So the purer route, I would let it uh, be on my um, colleagues, um, you know, discretion that they would be the ones who would be um, who would be talking about it. Next slide, please. So yeah, here are the resources and. And like I'm on cc.ca, physicians.apply and CARMS. Um, this is extremely important for you to get started. Um, for the College of Physicians of the, and Surgeons of Alberta or CPSO for Ontario, you really have to see which province you're, you're trying to move to. And that's, that's, that's where you have to explore the options if they have PRE options, because not every, um, uh, not every uh, province offers that. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, if there are any questions that I'm happy to answer or we could take. Um, Yes, thank you very much, Eamon. Thanks uh, thank for you, explaining Dr. so very well uh, thank in you, detail Dr. about all the process about uh, comms and residency. Uh, we will. Uh, I asked everyone to put your questions in the chat box and we will answer all the questions at the very end so we can finish all the presentations and we will take the questions at the very end. Um, I would also appreciate if everyone can uh, turn on their cameras because it's very important to see everyone who has joined us today and it's uh, easy to communicate when we are seeing each other. It looks very nice. So if uh, you don't mind, uh, please turn on your cameras so that we can see each other as well. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hosia Samreen and Dr. Hosia Samreen is going to talk about another pathway to medicine in Canada. One is CARMS that uh, Dr. Mehman Adnan ha has explained very well. Uh, there's another pathway that is called PRA, Practice Readiness Assessment, and Dr. Gosia Samreen is going to talk about it. Uh, she has the experience of uh, getting into medicine uh, through this pathway, and she's currently applying in uh, Alberta to get residency into family medicine. Uh, Dr. Gosia Samreen, welcome, and please introduce yourself, and then you can present. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Dr. Fiza. Uh, yes, my name is Hosia Samrin, as Dr. Fiza mentioned about. I will talk about today PRA route. Um, some things which are similar, which my colleague, she has already talked about. I will not discuss in detail those things, but the things which are different than CAMS application, I will 
uh, touch those things in my presentation and I will be ready to answer any question at the end, whatever you know is required and uh, is inquiries from your side. So I will start with it. So PRA is, uh, can I just move on the next slide, please? So, so first of all, we should know what is PRA. Um, I came back in Canada a long time ago, but when I landed, I had no idea about this program, that's what is PRA. Um, I came to know a little late, so, but it's very, you know, you're, you guys are very happy that you are knowing it before landing in Canada. Uh, this is a route in which, uh, you know, we, the College of Physician of Surgeon of Alberta uh, will help you to obtain your independent practice license, your to practice medicine in Alberta. So actually this is a process in which you bypass the residency in Canada. So can I move to next please? Okay, so first of all, because I am uh, pursuing my career as a family physician. So I will mainly touch the family route, family medicine route, uh, PRA route in Alberta. And I am also in living in Calgary. So. Uh, let's talk about what are the prerequisites and how it goes to apply. So I will go through Alberta one. So next, please. So first of all, when you plan to go uh, through this route of uh, residence, uh, this route of licensure uh, taking, this first step is you have to get a CPSA eligibility letter. So what are the prerequisites that, what are the requirements the CPSA is looking for to get their eligibility. So first of all, they will look, what do you have a medical degree, which is recognized by WHO and the, the famer as my colleague she discussed before. The next will be having English proficiency exam, which is IELTS. And recently they added OET, but as Eamon mentioned before, we have to look on the website, what are the changes they are making? They can be changed, but we should be, you know, keep us updated from the, uh, reviewing the website, what exactly is required. Previously, it was only IELTS. Before it was, they were accepting uh, other one also, but now OET is also added in this one. And requirement is the exactly same as Eamon talked about before, that it's need in each, uh, you know, uh, part, they required the seven, like in all the four components. And the next is at least you should have passed qualifying exam one. So QE1 is required to apply for CPSA for PRA route. And other than, uh, along with this, we need, as I am pursuing my career as a family physician, so we need at least two years of continuous. The word continuous is very important because this is, which, which was not required before, but it was added like two years, three years ago. And in, what is the meaning of continuous? That it should not be interrupted, you know, training, uh, which is very, very important because some of, I know some people who are not accepted uh, to, through this route because they, they have a gap of like maybe eight months or six months, they came back, then went back. So this gives, you know, a problem at the later end. So it's very important that you should have a continuous two year postgraduate training in the program, you are trying to get the PRA. As I am applying for a family physician, so I have done my two years rotation in family medicine in Pakistan. Next slide, please. Other thing is if you are not have done two years of practice, but at least you should have in the past three years, you should have your independent practice, at end plus at least one year of postgraduate training program for minimum one year in any you know recognized uh, hospital which is recognized in Alberta or in other provinces too. What does it mean? Like I know some people like who uh, who came back earlier and they have not done their even uh, uh, their residency uh, like the internship after their MBBS. So after MBBS. The same as Eamon said, that this is very important. Do your, uh, you know, uh, uh, do year or it is one year, what exactly when I did, it was only one year program, but now it's a two year program in multiple disciplinary, you know, rotation. This is very important. We should have those. 
And so what the other, uh, some of my colleagues, they went back now, they did one year of residence, uh, their rotation uh, as a, uh, their house job and one year in postgraduate training institute. So they also recognized their, uh, they got eligibility on these uh, two even. So this is also very important, or you should have practice at least two years in the past three years uh, to get your CPSA eligibility to go through the PRA route. Next slide, please. So there are some very mandatory rotations for PRA route, which is little bit different in each province. Uh, some province have, you know, maybe instead of four weeks, may have four, eight weeks, or some have eight weeks, but overall, this is almost the same. So I have written, which is almost covering each and every province. So can we go back, please, the previous slide? Uh, no. Yeah, this one. Thank you. So in this one, the, uh, the mandatory fields are medicine, surgery, gynae ops, pediatrics, emergency, psychiatry. So these are at least we should have eight weeks of rotation. Uh, in some province, they just need, like in Alberta, they don't need the eight weeks, but they need the four weeks of psychiatry. Uh, but in BC, they were asking eight weeks. So it's better to do you know, which is covering most of the provinces. So eight weeks should be done at least. And in family medicine, which is a community-based uh, clinic, there we have to do at least 16 weeks, like four months of rotation. So this is very important for, uh, because if you have missed this one, family medicine rotation, you are not eligible. So in which speciality you are pursuing, that speciality should be covered most of it. Next slide, please. So as I talk, there is little bit difference in each province. In Alberta, this was the all requirement, which I talked before. In BC, they have added little bit of more. In uh, BC means British Columbia, which is another province. Uh, in this one, they'd want you to have postgraduate training two years along with that. After you completed to your postgraduate training, 960 hours mean almost it should be four to six months of independent practice you are required. So then you are eligible to apply for their PRA routes. If, as I have not worked after my postgraduate training in Pakistan for two, year, uh, two years or 960 hours, I am not eligible for BC route. And definitely TDNM exam is for everyone. The next please. So in another province, I'm uh, Nova Scotia. I'm just highlighting, you know, the things which are different as per, from Alberta. So in Nova Scotia, this is the same, exactly 24 months of rotation and eight weeks of rotation in all these specialities. Next, please. Along with that, they are asking now, what is the difference from Alberta? Alberta is not asking me to have uh, after my postgraduate training two years off to have my independent practice, but. Now in Nova Scotia, they want two years of independent practice after postgraduate training. So after this, you get eligible to apply for PRA route. Next, please. And we, there is Saskatchewan is another province where we call the program SIPA and they are, they are requiring rotation, uh, two year rotation and the family medicine uh, plus IELTS is the same. It's, it's, IELTS is exactly the same in every each and every province, the seventh in each four categories or OET in Alberta, they are now accepting. I'm not sure about, uh, about provinces that we have to check. Uh, Pre-screening application in Saskatchewan, they usually ask you to apply for, and then they will go through your credential and then they approve you if you are eligible for their PR route or not. And then TDM exam, which is now international exam, which we have to take before we go through our, this part. Next, please. And along with that, they are also want you to have a little bit of more independent practice and currency of practice. Currency of uh, practice means in family medicine that at least you have worked in the past three years somewhat of independent practice, minimum of 450 hours of that. Next, please. So first, once I have done my two years of uh, you know, postgraduate training, in any one of the recognized, you know, institute which are which they will recognize here in Canada, what are the steps? I what I have to do next. So next is, you have to submit your eligibility 
by uh, for review of qualification for independence practice to the college for CPSA. CPSA will go through all your you know documentation whatever you have given to them that you have done this 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 and then they will allow you either and they will let you know that you are eligible for PR route or not the physician apply as Eamon already has my colleague she has already told you in detail about physician apply this is very important because in uh, for this route also we have to go through physician apply so we have to submit our uh, MBBS degrees, our PMDC, because I have to just uh, submit my dissertation. I have done all this before, but to someone who is coming new, they have to submit your degrees, their uh, PMDC, their house job certificates to be get verified. And also as uh, I recently, which one was done post uh, two year post graduate training, that's certificate has to be verified through physician apply. This is very important. In Alberta, they, if you have uploaded your document, college will see that you have uploaded, they will go through your application. But in some provinces, they will not uh, you know, let you even uh, go through further until unless it is source verified through physician apply. It's like BC, they will not allow you at all. And after this, through physician apply the same thing like they uh, our, through this route and other exam, we will apply for. This is TDM exam. What is TDM exam? Uh, before uh, uh, passing this exam, I'm not eligible to apply on any job. Like they will not consider me. TDM is therapeutic uh, uh, decision making exam in which most of like pharmacological question, multiple choice question scenario based where you have to pick up the drug, their side effects. So something like about more pharmacology we used to learn in third year of MBBS. After this, I have passed. Now I, I am at this point, now I'm applying for a secure in HS sponsorship position where I'm applying wherever the job opportunities are there, you will apply there through Doctors Jobs Alberta and you can uh, get a job through AHS. Then we will submit our supporting documents and we will start our PRA uh, route uh, further. So next, please. So I will just give, to give you an uh, you know, idea where are the hospital or where are the institute which are uh, approved in Canada because I know the people who came through these uh, uh, from who did their postgraduate training from these hospitals and they are working now. So that's, I just mentioned here. Uh, so Fatma Memorial Hospital, Shifa International, Zaudin and Dow Medical College. Okay, next please. In Fatma, this is the more, some information. If you are interested, you can go through it that uh, their directors and the person and their induction is in July and January. And even I know Zaudin, their induction is at the same time. Next, please. I think Samreen Aga Khan is also being accepted, right? Yeah, I should. Yeah, yes. I should. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then accepted. Just that. Uh, just a quick thing. Sorry. Sorry to interject. Um, it is being accepted. The only thing here is that uh, they don't offer in the bigger cities. It, the, their process, their program is run in Gilgit, uh, Gilgit Baltistan, if I'm not mistaken. So that's where you have to complete your two years residency. Uh, training yeah. or the family medicine diploma, which is uh, equivalent to a family, med family medicine training. So not the one uh, that is, I mean, Karachi. The, the one in Karachi. Karachi does not really offer that. Yes. Yeah. That's I know in Karachi is not offered. Yeah. Yeah. So after you have secured a job through AHS, the next step is preliminary clinical assessment. Uh, this is actually in, uh, AHS, they appoint a position, uh, whatever they, they, they appoint you for you. You have to work with them for three months. They will judge you, uh, your clinical, uh, clinically, how you strong you are and our ethical issues and everything will be judged there. And then if they pass, we move on to the next step, which is again, that supervised practice assessment, which is in the system where you have to start your job. This is also for three months. This is a kind of internal ass assessment. And the first one is external assessment. And both are for three months. Next one. As for speciality, if some of one, uh, some of you have already done FCPS or MCPS in some other subjects. So for that, next please. Uh, what is, I have learned so far, um, 
some of uh, who did MRCOG uh, and they've worked in Pakistan for a while, especially in Aga Khan. One of my friends, she worked there for after MRCOG for I think seven to eight years. When she came here, she got a chance and she was accepted through PRA route and she's working now as a specialist in OBS and Gaini, uh, specialist in, uh, in a city. And other one is uh, another one who also did somewhere else. My friend, she is also did MRCOG, but she was from Russia and she's also working now as a specialist. And uh, other and another one is pediatric. Uh, I have learned so far that uh, this is the thing where we can, uh, they are accepted through PRA route, but they have very vast experience independent who are accepted in as a PRA route practice as a pediatrician, like they were, uh, assistant professors, or they were in a teaching hospital, they got, they are now working as a uh, specialist here. Other than that, it's difficult to, if you have FCPS just and to, you know, enter as a specialist in the system. It's uh, difficult in Canadian healthcare system. Next please. So thank you so much. This is all about if any questions I, I can answer at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samreen, for highlighting uh, the PRA route. Uh, I know after listening to Eamon, some people might be thinking, oh, where are we going? <laughs> Calm, this is so difficult <laughs> to get into Canada. But PRA route is a little bit hope for all of us. Uh, when I came to Canada in 2002 um, and I applied and they plainly said they don't even accept any uh, Pakistani experience except my degree. So you guys are lucky. They are now taking, um, since 2010, I think PRA route is open and we have assessed many physicians from Pakistan, especially coming from Fatma Memorial Hospital, Zaudin Hospital, Dow Medical, Shifa Hospital. So uh, there is a hope, there's lots of hope. Uh, and that's why we are having this session here because we, we have seen uh, people have gone through lots of frustration. They did not know the routes to medicine in Canada. They just got their immigration. Yeah and they were happy to come to Canada, became the citizens, and they did not know what to do. So I'm uh, very thankful to Samreen to explain that there is a lot of hope. If you're planning to come to Canada, you should be mentally prepared what you have to do before coming to Canada. So there are, uh, obviously there are some positions for, for those who have done specialities like pediatrics and gynecology. We have seen very few people who got into um, uh, through PRA route to, to be accepted as a, as a pediatrician or ops and gynae uh, in remote areas, in the rural areas, not in the main cities. Uh, but there is a hope, but it's very, very competitive as compared to family medicine. There are more positions for family medicine. So all the girls who are young and new uh, uh, who are coming to Canada, they're just getting their graduation done or they're in the final years or getting married and coming to Canada. If they want to come here, I think family medicine is easier to apply through PRA route rather than having a specialty, but I'm not discouraging anyone who has done their specialty already. They can get it, but it's going to be a little bit more difficult than family medicine. So uh, I, I will answer, we will answer uh, actually all the questions you have put in the chat box a little bit later because I have Dr. Um, uh, Farad Noman with me today. She's a graduate of Fatma Jinnah Medical College and she is working with me as a clinical assistant in my practice. And I'm very proud of this young girl. She has done all the Canadian exams. Uh, unfortunately, could not get the residency in Canada, but she got residency in UK and she's moving to UK next month. I'm very happy and very proud of her achievements. Uh, she's going to talk about alternative pathways to medicine. Like someone is here already in Canada. I know some people have joined us today. Um, they are already in Canada. They don't know they have done their exams. What, what else they have to do while waiting to get into residence? Uh, so I would ask Dr. Uh, Farad Noman to please um, unmute herself, introduce yourself, and then a little bit, uh, a small presentation on alternate pathways for international medical graduates in Canada. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fiza, for the great introduction. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So my name is Dr. Farad Noman, and I'm also a Fatma Jinnah Medical College graduate. So it's a great honor for me to help you uh, to get some information about uh, some alternate pathways for international medical graduates in Canada. So next slide, please. So uh, those who are waiting to get into a medical practice license or who are not interested in getting uh, their uh, medical license 
they can explore these options. So I'm just giving you a sort of outline of the uh, options uh, to work um, as a clinical assistant. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, the clinical assistants are, uh, uh, their jobs are very much similar to uh, the physicians, but unfortunately they cannot work independently and they need to work as a, uh, under the supervision of licensed medical practitioners. Uh, there are some of the tasks of the physician assistants are like they can uh, uh, see the patient, they can take histories, they can conduct uh, physical examinations, they can assist in surgeries, and they can educate patients or prevent, uh, on the preventive health techniques or treatment options. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, physician assistants are a bit different from the clinical assistants. In order to become physician assistant in Canada, you uh, must have a two-year program. And uh, uh, in order to get more information, uh, you can go on the website of the Canadian Association of Physician Assistants. Uh, there are four institutions in Canada who are uh, offering these programs. And uh, one of the institutions is Manitoba Masters of uh, PA Studies. Then Ma McMaster University of uh, Physician Assistant Education Program. And there is a PA consortium that is Faculty of Medicine University of Toronto DS uh, PA program. And then Canadian Forces Health Services Training Center program. But uh, in order to enter into this program, you must be a member of Canadian Armed Forces. Um, so uh, now talk about the clinical assistance program. So these programs are different in different provinces. Like in Alberta, uh, you can get information on the website of Alberta Clinical and Surgical Assistant Program. Uh, as my colleague, Dr. Emin has already discussed about this program because she's working as a clinical assistant in Alberta. So in order to become a clinical assistant in Alberta, you need to pass your MCC to one exam and you should have uh, your language, language proficiency. Like either you have uh, uh, IELTS, with seven band or you have uh, OEP with uh, B score in each all components and you have uh, one year of internship, then you can apply for the eligibility. And after getting the eligibility, you can um, search for the jobs on the Alberta Health Services website. And after securing the job, uh, uh, CPS, that is the College of Physician and Surgeons in Alberta, gives you or grants you the limited practice license and you're eligible to work in the clinical or in the hospital setting. Um, so uh, this uh, clinical assistant programs are also uh, run in uh, Nova Scotia and in Manitoba. So you can go on the, these websites like College of Physician and Surgeons of Nova Scotia and Clinical Assistants of Manitoba. Next slide, please. Um, next uh, important option is to work as a research assistant. So um, if you have any research background, you can apply in any medical school or departmental research unit. And if you have a clinical research associate diploma, that many institutions, they are offering these programs in Canada. So that would be really helpful in securing these jobs. And uh, you know, this experience is very beneficial for your residency application because uh, it makes your uh, resume very attractive. Next slide, please. So uh, there is another option to become ultrasound physician or medical diagnostic sonographer. This is a three-year diploma program in diagnostic medical sonography. And uh, uh, these technicians, they basically operate ultrasound equipment to produce and record images of body, organs, and masses. And then these recorded images are interpreted by the radiologist to uh, make a report. So basically, uh, you work as the ultrasound technicians and you just uh, produce the images and then the report is made by the radiologist. Next slide, please. So there is another uh, option to become a medical office assistant. So it's a one year medical office assistant diploma program. So they are mostly work in clinics and they perform a wide variety of clerical and administrative tasks such as scheduling appointments, word processing, bookkeeping and accounting, photocopying, filing and answering telephone calls and other processing. Next. Uh, very similar to this program is a hospital unit here. This is also one year diploma course. 
and you know, unit helps perform a wide view of a variety of reception, clerical, and administrative. Sorry, this. Uh, very late here now is Isha time around midnight. Uh, Alberta has very, very long days. Just to let you guys know, Canada has different <laughs> uh, timings. Um, uh, during summer, we have very long days. Our Maghreb is around 10 p.m. and our Isha is uh, quarter to 11, so a quarter to 12, so it's very late here. But if you can unmute yourself. We can hear you now, Farah. So yeah, sorry, my pain has disappeared. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. I'm really sorry for that. Just wait for a minute, please. So I think I will open my uh, own presentation. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, we can hear you. I can go through the slides if you can oh, see okay, it. No worries. I am unable to assess the Zoom. Uh, I'm just uh, listening to you guys. And uh, yeah, we were talking about the hospital unit clear. So this is a one year diploma program. And unit clerks, they perform a variety of reception, clerical, and administrative duties at nursing stations on the units or wards, wards of hospitals. They do also work in continuing care centers, physician offices, and other medical facilities. Uh, next option is to become a medical lab assistant. This is also a diploma program. And medical lab assistants, they perform clerical and pre-analytical tasks, such as data entry and blood collections in medical laboratories. Uh, then there is another option to become emergency medical personnel. There are three levels of this career. One is the emergency responder uh, who require only a minimal training because they provide the first aid uh, at, in the emergency situations. When you call 911, they are the first people they reach there. And then emergency medical technicians, um, the eight months training is required for them. And then for emergency medical technologist uh, paramedics, uh, the eight, it's about two years training is required. Uh, then there is another option to become dental assistant or hygienist. Um, you will require an entirely new training. Dental assistants do clerical work while dental hygienists assess, diagnose, and treat oral health conditions. You need a degree to be a dental hygienist, but a one-year diploma course to be a dental administrative assistant is required. Uh, then there is the option to become a mental or psychiatric aid. Uh, mental health aids, they work under the direct supervision of uh, healthcare professionals, caring for people who are mentally ill, developmentally handicapped, cognitively impaired, or brain injured. Uh, for those who are interested to go to nursing, you, if you're interested in nursing, you would need to go back to a nursing school. And the options include doing uh, registered nursing, nurse practitioners that are two years course, and BSc nursing course that is a four year course. Um, then massage therapist is another option. And uh, in order to become a massage therapist, it is a requirement that the student attends an educational institution offering minimum of 2,200 hours of training. Then occupational therapist assistants, they help occupational therapists implementing treatment plans that are designed to develop, improve, or maintain clients' abilities to function independently. Um, then, um, there is an option that you can become a dietitian or nutritionist if you are willing to do it. 
but the minimum educational requirement is a four year degree in foods and nutrition, followed by a provincially approved uh, internship. If you want to work as a community service worker or community support worker, this requires a one year diploma. Uh, then there is also an opportunity to become an addiction counselor. It is a related university degree. Uh, this is preferred credential for addiction counselors. And depending on the place of employment, a related two year post secondary diploma plus related work experience or training may also be acceptable. Then there is an option to become a medical radiation technologist. This career group comprises of magnetic re uh, resonance imaging technologists, radiological technologists, nuclear medicines technologists, combined laboratory and X ray technologists, radiation therapists, and they all require two to three years of schooling. Then physical therapist assistants, the physical therapist assistants, this is physiotherapist in the implementation of treatment programs designed to improve or maintain client's abilities to function independently. Uh, then infection control professional, infection control professionals, they work in healthcare settings to ensure adherence to infection prevention and control standards and protect patients and healthcare workers from the spread of infection. The infection control professionals usually require a minimum of a bachelor's degree in any health related science, as well as a previous experience working in a healthcare setting. Infection control professionals are generally required to obtain their certification of infection control from their certification board of infection control within a certain time period after being hired. Then there is also another option to become a marriage and family counselor. And uh, they at least requires a master's degree in marriage and family therapy, social work, psychology, or related discipline. Then respiratory uh, therapist, the respiratory therapist, they work in healthcare team members in diagnosing, treating, educating, and promoting wellness in patients who suffer from cardiorespiratory disease and related disorders. The minimum educational requirement is a three-year diploma in respiratory therapy. Then there is another option to become a life skill coach. Life skill coaches prepare learners to deal effectively with personal issues by guiding them through activities such as self-discovery and behavior identification exercises. They work with individuals and groups. Its job description is quite similar to a community and social services worker. Then there are other options like you can work as a social worker, fitness instructor, recreational or athletic therapist, health coach, and you can also become instructor to teach basic health sciences like physiology and anatomy in some institutions. They are offering programs like medical office assistant, uh, the physical therapist assistants, or acupuncture. And you can also become a CPR and DLS instructor. And thank you. If you have any questions, then you can please ask me. Wow, thank you so much uh, for, it, uh, for telling us about the alternative pathways to medicine while people are waiting to get into residency. There's so many other options. Don't lose any hope. Uh, we are always thinking on one line most of the times, but I know there's so many doctors who are already here in Canada, international medical graduates, and they are uh, struggling uh, to get into the system, but they have to have to earn some money to you know feed their families as well. So um, so I think there are lots of hope. You can get into any other alternate pathways. Uh, find out, go to your, you know, AIMGA is a good resource. There's Center for Newcomers and uh, SIVA and those places. They, they help you, they guide you, uh, what you can do while you're waiting to get into the system. So thanks a lot, everyone. Now we're going to take a few questions. Uh, I know we are already too late. We will quickly go through the list if we can answer a few questions here. Um, they're very relevant questions. And I see Dr. Eamon has answered a few questions in the chat box. Thank you, Eamon, for doing that. Uh, so let's see what uh, people were asking from the very beginning. So um, hello, someone told me Canadian high school graduates don't need IELTS. Yes, yes they don't need IELTS. Yeah, so that's that's true. They don't need an English proficiency examination. 
So a question is from Shama. Dr. Fiza, could you, could you just tell something about two years of family medicine from back home? I think uh, Shama, you might have um, listened to Dr. Gosia Samri's detail about um, how to do two years of family medicine back home in which institutes you have to go to and get your residency from. Then is, uh, can we take MCCQE1 retake, especially to improve scores? No. no. You either fail and yeah. retake it, but yes. once you have passed, no. you're passed forever. At you're least forever. <laughs> I mean, in terms of you have cleared the exam and that is on board. However, we don't know if things will change going forward. So please um, keep yourself updated with the websites. So pre prepare very well for the exam. And that's, you know, if you fail it, then you can retake it. But if you passed, that's your last one. <laughs> You're passed forever. That's a good one. <laughs> okay. I got passed away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The next one is, I think we have four chances. No, this is not right. Okay. Does PRA route work in other provinces like BC? Yes, Dr. Vosia Samreen has explained it very well in different provinces. They have slightly different criteria, so you have to follow those through. And we will be sharing the recording, inshallah, and you can go through the slides again if you, I know it was lots of information to absorb, but you can go through the slides again. And does this two year of post-graduation training include 12, 12 months of residency in Pakistan? Uh, 12 months of residency uh, is nothing. 12. Yes. Residency <laughs> is either a couple of years or what you're trying to possibly uh, talk about is the internship or the house job. That's how we word it. So it's if it's the 12 month thing, yes. But if it doesn't have, um, it has to, any residency has to have an entering exam and then an exiting exam. If you drop in between, if that's what your question is, that wouldn't be unfortunately um, something counted as a residency. However, whatever you have done may be counted. I mean, just, yeah. just confirm with the licensing bodies. Yeah, for family medicine, you need to have family medicine rotations, as Dr. Samreen has mentioned, two, eight weeks rotations, continuous rotations. There should not be any break in between that is going to be counted. On top of that, if you have any other residency, 12 months, that's a different thing, but you have to qualify and you have to meet the criteria for each province here. So citizenship is also required for PRA route? Yes, most of the job where I have applied, they all ask you, first question is, are you a resident? And then we move forward. So they definitely give preference to those who are, uh, who have a, a permanent residence or citizenship. Yeah. yeah, and they prefer first who are resident, then they will look around outside. Yes, US yes. or any other side. And there's a lots of competition here. So if you are planning to come to Canada, apply for your immigration, get ready, get medicine, you know, your uh, family medicine rotations done. So by the time you come here, you write your exams and, you know, you apply. Yes. So, and I and, think and physician right. apply is the first thing to do, right? To I'm get just going to take it from Dr. Fiza. It's, it's, it's so kind of her to arrange this because around the time when we immigrated, we did, we had no clue no idea. whatsoever. This is such a good platform for you to get started. If you know, if you want to get, I mean, like she, she very rightly said, there are a lot of girls like us, you know, who get immigrated after their marriage mm -hmm. and who knows. And sometimes the entire family is moving in or you have applied the immigration or whatever. Know your steps so that when you're on the top of it, you would not have the difficulties and the, the turbulent sort of course of journey if you're well prepared. So this is extremely important, like this session tonight should get you started if you're hoping to get things done. Yeah. So if someone have completed four years training in pediatrics in Pakistan, also cleared the FCPS2 in peds and have worked independently as an attending uh, back in Pakistan can also apply via PRA pathway. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, what about Afghan? We have discussed that. Okay, if someone was born in Canada and holds a citizenship, but they did MBBS from Pakistan, will the application process differ in any way? And do they need an English proficiency exam in this case? So I've or I've answered that already. Okay. But it okay. may be slightly different if you completed the high school from here. You may not require, but if you were just born here and then you completed your education in another country, 
if it has English as a native language and you can go through on the MCC website, it tells about the exceptions there. So please uh, go through it. You will have the exact answer to it. But yes, if you've completed the MBBS, just the MBBS, uh, you know, then you may be exempted, but otherwise, no. So can a UK trained GP work in Canada as a family physician? Yes, they, we have lots of uh, GPs who have worked in UK and they have moved here and they're working with us as our colleagues here and they are accepted in Canada to work as a family physician. Okay, so can you please recommend us which books to follow clear MCCQE1 exam? That's a very common question. <laughs> I've answered that already. There are, okay. All the resources are very comprehensively given on the mcc.ca website. Please feel free to go through. Yeah, most common is the Toronto Notes, uh, just to give you guys an idea, but there could be some other resources, as Eamon said. You can go on the website and find out those. Can you uh, please recommend us which books? Okay, that's done. Uh, for UK trained GPs, if they fulfill the criteria, they may be able to use, answer that question. Okay. Anyone from Pakistan who is working in sick kids uh, who can help out for peers, people coming to Canada? Uh, what is this question? I unfortunately don't get this question. Anyone from Pakistan who is working in sick kids who can help out for peers, people coming to, I don't know, I don't understand this question. Do we need to complete any courses before working as a clinical assistant? No. No. There are no courses, there are prerequisites. And again, this question- And you answered answer. this question in detail, that's good. Has BC started accepting clinical assistance or is there any chance in the near future? Uh, I don't think they have a clinical assistant program. I think it's um, the Saskatchewan, Alberta, and uh, probably two other places, Nova Scotia, and I believe Newfoundland and Labrador, if I'm not. Yes, concerned. yes. Um, so. But about their plans, Unfortunately, we can't tell about their plans. If they might, who knows? Okay, uh, what else? Thank you, okay. I have finished my training in hematology and will be taking my FCPS2 exam soon. Can you please guide me what route will be, the, will, will be best for me? I plan to take FRC path do in, is that accepted in Canada and help me enter as a consultant? So these are difficult questions. We cannot say for sure. A PRA road could be one, uh, how difficult it can be. We cannot say anything about it. As I said, most easy thing is to get into family medicine in Canada. There are some options around uh, obtaining fellowships as well, but again, this is out of the scope of our yes. tonight's session. So yes. uh, we'll encourage that you go through the, the, the websites and, and find that out and then either write to the licensing body if there's something that you want, ans uh, want answered. Can we do two years of MCPS in family medicine instead of FCPS? Yes, that's absolutely fine too. MCPS is the same yes. thing. Uh, you just need two years of your uh, continuous residency and then you can write MCPS. I think, Samreen, you wrote MCPS too? I, yeah, I wrote MCPS too. But the thing is, wherever you do MCPS, it should follow the same sequence, which is required here. Yeah. Uh, that they should have a logbook. They should have, you know, uh, all three-month assessments. So these are the things which college asks your college, uh, your hospital back, they will, they will verify it before giving you eligibility. So it's very important that you should know where are you are going? Where are they following the same you know, requirements which is acceptable in Canadian system? If you simply do MCPS um, and they have no, you know, uh, the same assessment process and same logbook, because even from me, they asked, you know, uh, my hospital to send us back all the exams results, three months assessments and logbooks. So this is the only thing which I will, you know, emphasize, just make sure they're following this one, then MCPS is fine. Yeah. Thank you, Samreen. Uh, can specialists apply for family medicine residency in Canada? Yes. We have many specialists here. They have done obstetrics and gynecology in Pakistan. Pedi there were pediatricians. They were general surgeons. They had to go through the CAMS process, and they had to apply for family medicine. We have actually so many of the uh, Pakistani and other international medical graduates who have been specialists in their hometowns, but here they are working as uh, family, family physicians. So yes, you can. 
it is more difficult is it more difficult to obtain inter, uh, i internal medicine residency through cams pathway compared to family medicine uh, no we have many uh, uh, international medical graduates who have got uh, residency into internal medicine recently as well there are less positions of internal medicine as compared to family medicine but we have uh, more uh, openness to internal medicine residency as well uh can we have any contact number or email address of admin or co-host yes we're going to put our um uh, amen you can add md international's uh, email address here and i'm sure. i'm going to put my own email um uh, so they can email us if there's a, there are any questions you can always email us we uh we have a whatsapp group for our fatma jana medical graduates and we have entered lots of fatma jana medical graduates in our own alumni uh in a whatsapp group as well so you can contact me if you want to enter into um uh, mdi group or into uh fatma jana group so i'm going to write my email address here okay so i think uh, that's uh, we have answered most of the questions today uh it was very um i think a uh, quite good session because of my very good friends here umme imanitnan kosia and dr farhat thank you so much for joining it was too late here and i really really appreciate all your guidance and uh, support to all those who needed it and thank you everyone for joining from wherever you are in pakistan canada or whichever part of the world uh, stay blessed and never ever lose hope come to canada canada is a beautiful place beautiful people here beautiful pure environment uh, and many opportunities to do many things with yourself and with your families so thank you so much and inshallah we will be in touch all right allah hafiz thank you so much